welcome to the Redevelopment Commission for the City of Beach Grove this day of Thursday, June the 11th, 2020, uh, City Hall, Beach Grove. Uh, I will start the meeting. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Lamping, President of the RDC. We will start by introducing the Commission members. We'll start on my right. Uh, Kathy Chappell, Secretary. We have uh, our member calling from outside. We have for executive order of the Governor. He's calling in on, on through the phone. Go ahead and now. Uh, and Vice President of the RDC. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. And we have in, in pre present tonight at the meeting, we have our attorneys, Mr. Robert Run and Alex Carlisle, along with Mr. Jack Peters, uh, the accountant. Uh, we will start the meeting. The agenda number one is the approval of minutes from April 2nd, 2020, which is a telephonic meeting. Uh, everyone's had a chance. Nathan, you had a chance to read over the minutes? treasurer 
and legal counsel, when the new allocation area begins to deliver revenues, that should be segregated into its own fund. And at that point in time, we'll divide this into two and show you both of those going forward. The basis for this exhibit is to show that you have needs beyond what you have revenue and cash for, which is basically showing how you have allocated all the property tax proceeds that you are expected to get for the projects of the Redevelopment Commission. And as we get to the bottom section in the ending fund balance, it shows a negative in 20 and 21, which basically says that you need to continue to collect these tax tip increment revenues in order to continue to fund your projects. And at this point in time, you're a little bit over allocated. But again, part of that will be cash flow. Um, one of the commitments that are in here as an expenditure are infrastructure, utility improvements for the CSX area, which may or may not happen this year, may not happen in the extent. Um, there's also a lot unknown yet in that area that you may need to develop going forward. But just to walk you quickly through this sheet, it shows beginning in 2019, the allocation area had $721,630. It brought in approximately $690,000 in revenue, spent approximately $815,000 to end the year at about $595,000, which you started 2020 with. The anticipated revenue for 2020 is approximately $746,000. You have debt service payments to make in 2020 at $526,600. We've also got in there $845,000 toward projects, including, as we talked about, those CSX um, utility infrastructure improvements. If all that were to come to fruition in 2020, you would be overspent in the ending fund balance by about $29,000. In 2021, we're estimating that you would receive the same amount of increment as in 2020, just because we have no better knowledge at this point in time. When you originally financed the bonds for the TIF district, and then when you refinanced the TIF district bonds back in 2016, one of the commitments that you made to bondholders was that you would set aside an additional amount of money, which is traditional in revenue bonds, and it's called the debt service reserve. The amount that you had in debt service reserve and have today is $240,000. In 2021, we're showing that coming back in. It stays in reserve until it can be used for the final payment or the final couple of payments, which will be your circumstance here. In the expenditure section, you'll see in 2021, current debt service is going to be $399,360. We've anticipated that you may have another 500,000 in projects toward your development area. And then the future debt service of $131,560 is the last payment for all of your outstanding bonds, and it's due in January of 22. So again, in 2021 or beginning of 2022, if all of this were to come to fruition, you would be overspent by about $73,000. But again, we don't know the cash flow and the extent to which you're going to have to commit funds for that development in the CSX area and obviously you're not going to expend more than you have so you'll have to pick and choose if it comes to that and part of that bill will have to be picked up by someone else or picked up in a future year as a reimbursement something like that so for the flow of funds does anybody have any questions on that Gary, do you have a question? 
Jerry, if you could come to the microphone so it can be recorded, please. Sure. It's so much easier for us to hear up here. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Hall, 7238 sub 6. Uh, sir, on the 845 you refer to, um, can you break that down because you said there's an issue with the CSS? Can you go to death on that or can you make sure that you have to go council update on that? Can you please get that on the server? Um, that amount was requested in the budget mm -hmm. as an appropriated amount, which is the authority for them to expend that amount of money toward that project. Okay. Specifically, what it is for, um, I was told at one point, utility, um, what was it when you moved it? It's sewer relocation. Sewer relocation. And yeah. I think it was 600 or 650 yeah. is, is what was. Um, and then there sort of were some other things included in that along that same line. But that was part of the budget that was presented last fall right. to the city council. But there's been changes since then. So can you request the update on that? How is that was affected? Um, this doesn't reflect any yeah. changes. This is what I believe was appropriated. Right. So this authority still stands today that they could expend it if they chose to. Okay. So from a legal perspective, with that amount of money, what's the plan behind the curtain? Are we going to continue? Moving forward with those monies for the infrastructure for specific properties, seeing that that's off the table, or have you guys released that yet? No, no, we're not releasing. We have. I don't think it's off the table. Yeah. Uh, we've been told that it's it, it's on hold. Yeah. yeah. That's all we've been told. Well, the, the milestone folks have pulled out too. Have they re reported oh. the fact that Parish Group? I'm sure you guys all know that. That was not. Oh, you're not. That was not made knowledgeable. We were not. Do you know what? No, we're not aware of anything more than than you would know from the city council. And that hasn't been that hasn't been told to us from the city council either. Okay, so when they, they did what? That company called and, and said, "Yeah, this is off the table." So anyway, so you're talking what less than half a million dollars that's projected in 20 on that budget that's no longer. Are we going to put infrastructure into a property that's not quite frankly moving forward? No, I don't think there's any plan. We're not that, planning uh, to put So of that 845, that was part of that. Six, right? 600 or 650 was for the sewer relocation. Which is which may, which may or may not happen. Right, right now it's okay. so okay. Okay. okay, so if it does not happen, then what will happen to those monies if that does not happen? Okay, if, if those monies are not expended at 1231 of 20, they become eligible cash, and it'll just stay in here as a cash balance. So rather than being negative, this would be positive five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand. So just to clarify, you don't know that as the president of RDC. No. You don't know that. No. Also? No. Okay, that's concerning to me because a phone call. So it's it's out there. So then, what fraction of that money could actually go back to like to the school or something like that? Um, we'll get into the impact of how that flows in. Okay. okay. Thanks, guys. Okay. So kind of to follow up on that. Whatever amounts that you have appropriated that you do not extend, right. stay in your fund right. because they are required to be spent toward the redevelopment purposes for which they were collected. Um, and there's not and a deadline when those have to be set. They stay in. Like they would stay there indefinitely unless there were some weird circumstance, and then we'd have to get all the attorneys involved and yeah, to make the fund dormant. But in in all normal regards. It stays in that fund until it is spent for the redevelopment purposes that you have in your different redevelopment plans. But again, if these expenditures are not made in 20 or 21, you will have additional cash here that you can then decide to allocate toward other projects mm -hmm. consistent with your redevelopment plan. Mm -hmm. Or something else that I would like to talk to you, and I think I'll yeah. postpone it until a little bit later in the the thing are potential projects that you might want to look at. But staying in line with the annual report or the annual presentation to the overlapping taxing units, that next page of commentary pretty much just walks through what I uh, told you and explained on the first graphic. The first tax impact is for Center Township. And in 2019, it had no incremental revenue. So if we can, I want to skip past that because I want to show the impact and how it flows through. 
Second tax impact is for Franklin Township. And if you look at the top section, it shows you each of these local units of government mm -hmm. that are impacted or have area subject to the implementation of this allocation area inside Franklin Township. So in 2019, the tax rate for all these different units of government is 5.3169. So that's $5.31.69 for each $100 of AB. Of that, in the next column, there is 2.27 cents of that rate is made up of funds that are specifically collected based on their rate and not their levy. And just to kind of go back, when we have levies in place for the operations of virtually all of these units of government, they are derived from a statutory formula that grows from the previous year. And it grows by a growth factor that is equivalent to the six-year average growth in non-farm income for the state of Indiana. So in 2019, that growth factor was, I believe, 3.4%. The growth factor in 2020 was 3.5%. So to get the levies and then the rates for these different units of government, you take the previous year's levy, multiply it by that growth factor, then you divide it by the entire assessed value of that geographic area that it's serving times 100 to get this tax rate. So when you have these fixed rate funds, they will collect the amount of whatever assessed value is eligible to be taxed based on that fixed rate, irrespective of the maximum levy. It's outside, kind of above and beyond it. So the Franklin Township area, if we go to the middle column, 2019 TIF AB is approximately $7.5 million, $7,539,293. If you were to release that entire amount of incremental assessed value that you're using to generate your TIF revenue into the tax base, it will lower the rate for all of those funds that are maximum levy driven and then it would create additional revenue for those funds that are rate driven. So this top segment shows how you have the additional seven and a half million dollars in TIF AV that it changes the taxing district rate from 5.3169 to 5.2483. If you change that rate in a downward fashion like that, you will have less properties that achieve the one, two, and three percent tax caps. If that happens, then you will have more money net collected in property taxes to share amongst all these taxing units in the taxing district. And that amount is estimated in the middle of the page in the little box there, estimated reduction of circuit breaker. If I change the rate from the 5.3169 to 5.2483, I would anticipate $35,189 of additional net collected property taxes to be distributed to these units. Down below that, it shows you the distribution for Marion County. We would estimate they'd get approximately $2,807. Beach Grove School would get approximately $16,683. Um, the referenda in this is not impacted because it directly taxes all those properties firsthand. The Beach Grove City, the impact would be estimated at $11,417, etc. The bottom section of this 
shows the impact for those rate driven funds. And that's why you'll only see it in this example for Marion County, special transportation and health and hospital. So if we released seven and a half million dollars of assessed value back into the tax base for Marion County, its rate driven fund is 1.28 cents. So that 1.28 cents applied against that seven and a half million dollars divided by 100 gets you approximately $965 of property tax. And then remember, every time that we levy a property tax for that fund, you automatically collect additional taxes that piggyback on top of it. Those specifically being vehicle excise taxes. So every time you go to the license branch and you pay that excise tax fee, they locate where you live and send that money back to the taxing district. And the taxing district is your specific geographic area that is served by the identical taxing units. So, you know, we'll have two different taxing districts on, let's well, say we're a school line. If one's Beach Road Schools and one's Perry Schools, it may have identical taxing district rates for all those other units of government except the school. So you'll have different rates for people across the street, but when you go to the license branch, that money comes back and goes specifically to the group of taxing units that provide you service. So that piggyback tax was approximately five and a half cents on the dollar. So on that $965, we would expect 53 additional dollars total tax impact would be 1018 Likewise, for special transportation and health and hospital, you've got some tax loss there. The summary on the bottom shows you circuit breaker, the total of 35189 and then the total impact of approximately 37000 when you add in the property tax. next page shows you the Perry Township section of your allocation area. And you'll notice that the TIF AV is approximately 18.2 million. So again, if we thrust that back into the tax base, the district tax rate would be expected to drop from 5.2982 to 5.1325. That would be expected to produce another $141,921 in reduction of circuit breaker to be shared across those units of government. And again, the property tax section in the bottom. Next page would be Warren Township. The TIF AV for that segment of your allocation area is only $870,740. So it barely moves the taxing district rate, therefore it only is projected to spin off about $48 in reduction to circuit breaker. And again, the bottom section shows you the loss or the um, impact to the property tax and the circuit breaker combined. Next page shows the combined tax impact. So if we tally all these together, the circuit breaker impact is approximately $177,000. The property tax impact is about $6,400. So the total is approximately $183,500. through my notes to make sure I touched on everything for you. Um, one of the things, and you know, this may speak to the to Mr. Hall's comments earlier. The above tax impact and circuit breaker analyses show the result of releasing all of the captured TIF incremental assessed value back into the tax base. Contrary to the belief of some, 
the full amount of that incremental revenue captured by the allocation area does not return to the other taxing units in the taxing district. And a lot of that has to do with what I talked about with those maximum levy driven funds. Just because you are collecting property tax through your TIF increment um, abilities does not allow these other units of government to get that same revenue. They are still limited within that statutory maximum levy or a debt levy that only provides for principal and interest payments when they become due. So in this instance, you know, we talked about revenue estimated, or let's see, we had actual revenue for 2019. Actual revenue was $689,498. The impact to these units of government in total is $183,000. So given that situation, you have uh, a great deal of money collected into the redevelopment commission coffers that if you let it go back to the tax base it will not go to those other units of government like the schools in its entirety now that combined impact does show that the schools combined impact about $84,000. So they would be $84,000 better off. The city would be $57,000 better off. But as a community, you all are better off by the entire amount that you're collecting in the Redevelopment Commission, assuming that you are undertaking projects that benefit all of the community. And most of the commentary there is what we just talked about. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the annual presentation. And just for public awareness, this presentation is something that happens every year at every RDC at this time or, or the month before, whatever. But this is this is a. a before June 15th. It's mandatory that that, or I guess, is that correct to say um, Kind of two different things there. This is mandatory. It happens every year. Yours happens around this time of year. Other people yeah. happen at different times. Before the next thing we're going to talk about is June 15th specifically. That's why I just want to make sure yeah. that everyone understood this is not something that we're just doing now. This just happens at every, this is, uh, Every year, yeah, for the last couple of years, you've now had to give this presentation to the overlapping taxing districts or units. And just a question for the minutes. And I, I know Mr. Gary Hunt's here from the Common Council. Is are there any representatives from any of the other taxing units? Because that is correct. There were, we, we sent out. All the different yeah, about a dozen letters, letters, I think. Yeah. There was an invitation. All I have on that one. Nathan, do you have any questions? I don't think you take any action on that, Bob, or is that just this is the obligation of the zone? Yes, yes. Yeah. Is that, you're done with your presentation? I'm done with that one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Go ahead. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, ready for the next one? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, something that has gone on for a long time, probably a decade, maybe longer, is you have an annual obligation before June 15 to notify the county auditor and the Department of Local Government Finance whether you're going to release any of this assessed value back to the tax base, as we just kind of talked about. You have two specific scenarios that um, I've included in a little report for you. I know we talked earlier and you didn't have it, but I'll bring you this copy for the board. And part of this is what legal counsel has drafted your resolution from. But 
two big components for you needing to collect your taxes in 21 is your debt service. When we sold your bonds originally in, I think, 2004 and 6 or 2005 and 7, sometime around there, we were allowed to sell them with no additional backups, even though you have a highly concentrated area of some of the retail and sale members. Today, we could never make that sale without additional securities of a backing of maybe the income tax of the city or additional property tax backing or some sort of bond insurance. So one of the obligations you have to your bondholders is not to jeopardize their bonds of yours that they still own that are outstanding. With that scenario alone, because you have no other security, I would advise you until such time as those bonds are paid off, which you should have enough money and everything done by the end of 21 to make your final payment in January of 22. Um, I would advise you to collect all of the tip increment that you have in order to not jeopardize these bondholders because they have no backup security from you. The second part is what we looked at in that last analysis on the cash flow for 2019 through 2021. That's an illustration of if you had to make these commitments, you would have uh, more expenditures than you have revenue, and therefore that is also your justification that you should be able to collect additional incremental revenue in future years, at least 2021 for this. that I'd be happy to answer any questions specific to that. So because of the bond that came previous to the SRMC and the previous RMC, uh, you know, we need to, as you said, with, the, with the, the tax to secure our ability to pay that bond. So this secures our ability to pay that bond by the income tax. Correct. You are addressing the collection of paid 2021 taxes in this motion today. And we cannot risk not making those securities to pay that bond because the, 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 uh, the penalties, I guess I should say, of us not making a good decision to make sure we have the money to pay that bond, the risk, the penalties, what would the penalties be? If we uh, the penalties would probably be that everybody's getting sued. Okay. Uh, okay. The other thing is if you default yeah. and they would have to sue you for the money, okay. I don't know how we would ever issue bonds in the future for not only the redevelopment commission, okay. but the city because they are you know, issued on behalf of the city based through the redevelopment commission, I believe. So that would be something as a community I would advise you never to do to default on any of your debt. Never, yes. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear and those questions were asked and that was clear on the record for the community to hear. Okay. And then before you get into the resolution, do you mind if I take a few minutes to kind of talk about a project and thought of? Sure. Okay. Yeah, um, as we, we've talked about before, as your bond comes up and expires, mm -hmm. your revenue stream can continue on in the main area through like 2030, mm -hmm. and then in the medical area through 2034, in the new area, we're not sure of the deadline yet. But when you look at that annual presentation and the impact versus the amount that you collect as a redevelopment commission, that is the most efficient collection of taxes because you get to collect everybody else's taxes in that taxing district structure. Uh, the other taxing units of county, library, township, school, et cetera, come into your coffers and then you can do a community-based project that benefits everybody. I would advise you to think through your redevelopment plans 
and what you think is most beneficial to continue to utilize that stream rather than let it go back and only partially benefit these other units of government. Um, so that you could do something with those revenue streams for the community. Two things that have been brought to my attention over the last couple years from the mayor are public safety structure for police and public safety structure for fire. I don't know that you could do both of those out of the revenue stream, but you could probably do one of them. Um, in a situation where we're getting to the end of the life of the revenue stream, and as we talked about before, today I would not be able to sell those bonds without any backup. It would make sense to back the bonds with property taxes of the city. And alternatively, if you didn't use any of the TIF revenue toward one of these projects, you potentially, if you undertake the project, you're gonna pay for it with property taxes imposed on just the geographic area of the city. If you can contribute TIF funds toward those projects, you will reduce the amount of tax impact for all of your fellow citizens in Beach Grove. Now, again, this assumes that everybody believes that we need, and not everybody, but a majority or consensus believes that we need one of these projects or both of them. If you're going to undertake it as a community, I would suggest that you consider utilizing your TIF revenue. Um, you know, if you come to a conclusion that no, all our facilities are fine, we don't need to do that, we don't want to go into debt, that's well and good as well. But um, I did want to bring that to your attention that there are projects that have been talked about. If you're going to undertake them as a community, think about utilizing your TIF money. It would be a good use of it. It would be invisible tax impact wise right now because it's already being allocated as tax increment revenue. It is, um, you know, not an impact to the taxpayers to leave it alone until it expires. And, and that decision wouldn't be made until our bonds are paid off? Uh, no, you could go ahead and, and line it up now because one of the things, and you know, I've talked to city council before about mm -hmm. if you go into a project because of the cost of public safety structures, you will be beyond your constitutional debt limit, which is one third of 2% of the assessed value of the city. When you exceed those amounts, you have to do your financing through what's called a lease rental agreement, which is what schools do. Schools never have enough tax base and bond cap to build all the facilities they need, so they always have the school building corporation, which uh, issues the bonds and has a lease back through the school and that's how you get above and beyond that one-third of two percent cap. So in your situation, you would do it through a lease that would be approved both through the redevelopment commission and if you're using redevelopment monies and the city council for the property tax back portion and as authorization for use of the redevelopment monies as well. The lease and not taking out another bond? Um, they would be lease bonds, lease bonds, but not general obligation bonds. Okay. okay, and then they, they negotiate the interest on those and all of those? Those could be negotiated or we could sell them competitively. Okay. Um, I, I always advise people that a negotiated process is a lot more orderly. Uh -huh. You get virtually the same results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know ahead of time going in. You know, we can structure time-wise. We may have a timeline that says we want funds by May 31, mm -hmm. but if the market looks bad, if we have something odd happen, we can stop, uh, wait, go back in and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you publish for a date for a competitive sale, you have to have the sale on that date. You can turn down all of those bids on that date, but you can never accept a bid that is worse than the, your best bid on that day if you continue it for a 30-day period. And um, I advise you not to go that way if possible. It's a lot more orderly to negotiate it. And then this, would this be in partnership with, with the city if it happens in partnership with the city and the money that the city 
the the city council would have to approve you issuing bonds um, they would also have to approve their issuance of bonds and again i'm assuming that you might have to pool the two together to get your project done that's what it's kind of like the trail okay. thank you yeah I think you should. Okay. okay. Resolution number five. A resolution of the redevelopment commission of the city of Beach Grove, Indiana, determining that there is no excess, excess, excess value to allocate to overlapping taxing districts. Or as pursuant to Indiana Code 36-5-25-8, the redevelopment commission of the city of Beach Grove, Indiana, commission invited all overlapping taxing districts a representative to its June 11, 2020 regular meeting at which the commission gave an informative presentation to those in attendance regarding the operations and finances of the commission. Whereas the commission, in, consult in consultation with its financial advisor, has studied the assessed value property within the commission's allocation area or areas in order to determine whether any excess valuation exists and or as pursuant to Indiana Code 36-7-14-39B-4, the commission is required to notify certain authorities regarding whether there was any excess assessed valuation collected by the commission, and whether any excess valuation will be passed through to the overlapping taxing unit. Now, therefore, be resolved by the commission as follows. Number one, the commission finds that no funds from excess valuation were collected by the commission during the past year. Number two, the commission further finds that as a result, no excess valuation funds will be passed on to overlapping taxing districts. Number three, clerk treasurer of the city of Beach Grove, Indiana and or an officer of the commission is directed to send notice to the Marion County Auditor the Common Council of the City of Beach Grove and the fiscal officers of each overlapping tax unit of the findings of this resolution adopted this 11th day of June 2020. Yes, um, and just a brief clarification. Um, the first citation was 36-7-25-8 and um, in, um, in in some cases, uh, the resolution refers to taxing units as opposed to taxing districts, but okay. um, that's not a substantive issue. Okay. Um, and this is required. We've been doing it for several years. Um, um, previously, we had done it um, in May because we didn't meet in June. And, uh -huh. yeah. and um, uh, our deadline on this one is uh, we have to notify appropriate uh, state government agencies uh, by uh, June 15. So if, um, if we need a motion, a second, and if you have any questions, uh, any either questions? myself or uh, Mr. Questions? Peters can. Nathan, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I read it. Okay. So if I could get a motion to approve resolution number five, um, I'll motion. Okay. I, I second. Mr. Uh, Rich, first, uh, uh, make a motion and Kathy second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So the motion passes with a vote of three. And then is there a sign? Do we have a, a sign signature page? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
than you've done. Is that okay? Two of them are here. And since Mr. Um, Griggs is not available, if uh, he can feel we'll be able to sign uh, when he's present, correct? Y yes, yes. Yeah, I can go by and sign it on Monday. So we sign, I apologize, sign one yeah. packet. If and I'm you could also sign this one as well, it's right. the same resolution. So we need one for the city? Yeah. Uh, and then, if anybody has any questions about that, 
the next is update on issues related to video, uh, videotaping of the RDC meeting. As well, the city uh, has come to the conclusion that they will be uh, providing the videography for uh, all meetings, from what I understand, for the city. Uh, I thought Mr. Um, Strollwalter would be here tonight, but I'll check on that communication. Maybe I hope if that was my fault for miscommunication, I will accept that. Uh, but uh, but our RDC will no longer be uh, paying invoices for videography for uh, our RDC meetings. Uh, next is other business. Uh, I don't think I have anything unless Kathy or Nathan has anything to add. I have not. Okay. And I did not check to see if there was anybody signed in for public comment. I didn't check anybody. Okay. We can give an opportunity for any public comments at this time if anybody wants to come to the podium. If not, I can get a motion to adjourn. I can get a motion to adjourn this seat the meeting. I'll motion. I'll second. All those in favor uh, to adjourn the meeting. Kathy, what time is it? Seven fifty-three. That's seven seven fifty-three. I'll have my classes. And then we plan to have our next meeting before I forget. Uh, I think we will plan on having our next meeting in the chambers on Thursday, July the 16th. That's the third Thursday of the month. I think we're in agreement to go ahead and have an agreement. So the next meeting, Thursday, July the 16th at 1900 hours or 7 p.m. in the chambers here at City Hall. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but I appreciate you guys working with me. I will see you guys next month, okay? Thank you very much. I'm glad that you can hear us okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan.